Do it. Okay. Yeah, show me. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll set it it's so that I can. Wow, it's tight. Yeah. No, there's an there's an adjuster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, somewhere up here. It's one of these. Uh, podium. Podium. Okay. So we can get it up just enough. Okay. Yeah, sure. And I'll okay. do that. Like I won't hello, hello. All around, you know, and that's hi, hi. Yes. Way you'll get consistent okay. sound. Happy okay. to do it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, when you know, when all the seats get filled, then people will sit up front. Right? So uh, yeah, I had to. I did turn the lights down here because this uh, that was a little bit you know washed out. But other than that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Afternoon. Check, check. <laughs> Microphone check. Here's how they'll know that I'm the, the speaker and you're not. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> do you want to get started or do you want to wait a few minutes? How are we doing? What's time? Well, it's time to go, but, you know, I'm typically oh, here. Three. I'd give it like uh, another five minutes. Two minutes. Two oh. minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes more. And then if people want to trickle in, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah, I was the same way. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you're getting kind of speed, find yeah. our comfort, yeah. comfort yeah. zone. Yeah, that's too bad. That's too we have bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what happens when you're in a good, a nice town. Well, yeah, that's two lanes so like that too. Yeah. Yeah. Or here. Yeah. All right. Hmm? Oh yeah, it's good. Studio day. Most of these guys are done, so it's actually worked out really well. I like it when people aren't nervous, like oh man, I'm gonna go. A few more. Yeah. That's right. All right. And if you have any like technical issues, just no worries about that. We'll get it fixed. I'm just gonna freak out. Okay. You know that's what I would do. All right. Ready? Okay. Thanks for coming. It's the first time I've used a mic in this room, so it sounds a little funny. Um, uh, today we're going to have a talk uh, by Robert Corser, as it says, from the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, besides being an accomplished architect, Rob is also an amazing design builder, uh, an even better teacher, and he's my friend. Um, and that's about all I'm going to say. I'm going to let him do the rest. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming out during studio time. Um, and thanks to Patrick uh, for inviting me and Michael Hughes as well. And this is my second time visiting um, AUS. And the first time, let me get my uh, pointer, was for Design Week uh, in 2011. Um, uh, Michael Hughes invited me to come out um, for a week and to do a week long um, uh, kind of charrette project with a group of students. And that project was based a lot on my research in digital fabrication, which has to do with um, uh, leveraging digital tools to try to reinvent uh, different kinds of joinery. And it's uh, sort of work that um, I see examples of around uh, your school right now. 
Um, and I've done a lot of projects where the constraints have to um, do with uh, trying to harness the properties of materials and to avoid the use uh, or eliminate the use of fasteners or glue or other sorts of um, things. So this is the, uh, the project that I set for the students here. Um, and we were using uh, Lexan plastic that could be cut pretty easily and then um, bent and uh, formed with interlocking joinery into a variety of shapes. So here's our presentation. Um, your digital fabrication tools were relatively new uh, six years ago, going on seven years ago. So it was fun to be one of, pe one of the people, there were about six or seven others here doing different kinds of projects um, using your new tools. And the students did a variety of really interesting um, projects. Some of them were more uh, formal uh, based on shape that became small table elements. Other ones were for seating, um, and so here's the small table piece, uh, and uh, something that was supposed to be a table, but uh, the magazines didn't really sit on top. Our, our Lexan was fairly thin, and so they needed to use the magazines to actually keep it from falling over on itself. Um, but a lot of them were surprisingly um, comfortable and sturdy, and uh, this, uh, this pair, this grouping of things I, th I find quite interesting. This one is a chair that you really couldn't sit in, so it sort of looks like a chair but had to be used as a table. But the one with the uh, cushion, as Michael will um, <laughs> attest, is uh, surprisingly comfortable. So I had a wonderful time. And uh, so I want to thank Michael for bringing me here then, and uh, Patrick and Greg Spa um, to you know, um, start a little um, push to get me to come back here to see uh, some of the things that I've been following from a distance, which were the great um, design, build, and fabrication projects that have um, uh, been done here in the past six years. So it's a real pleasure to come back. Um, my talk today is not about my research, it's about my teaching and about small-scale design build projects, largely in response to different kinds of disaster. And um, a little bit of my thinking about this in, in retrospect, going back over about 10 years worth of, of projects, I'm not going to show you all of the ones that I've done with students, but a, a variety of them. Um, I started to think about um, how we are responding as a profession um, to uh, climate change and um, natural disasters that are exacerbated by climate change. So Architect Magazine had this uh, cover just a couple of issues ago, uh, encouraging architects to um, step up their game in trying to stop this from happening. And I, and I find it kind of odd to even imagine that we can stop climate change. I and mean, we certainly have an important role in uh, doing everything that we can to address climate change um, with every project that we do and in our teaching and research. Um, but, you know, I, I think that it's um, really obvious that at this point um, that the disasters that are being um, uh, intensified by our changing climate are proof enough that climate change is real and that we have a lot to do. But you know, one question that I have is what is the architectural response to climate change and disasters um, that might be related to it? Often um, we couch our, our responses in terms of technology, um, better performing buildings or um, systems, um, things like that. And I'm more interested in resilience. I know that there's a lot of talk about resilience these days. And I, and I find it curious that we don't really, I think, have a good shared understanding of what resilience is. And I'm not going to try to uh, totally define resilience through the work that I'm going to show today. But I am curious to try and see if there are qualities that can help us define, not define, but describe resilience um, in better or more nuanced or richer ways. Um, the, the projects um, that I'm going to show, and I've presented them in different um, contexts, but generally I organize them and want to talk about them in terms of the, the forces in our built environment that um, might be the most at stake in a given project or scenario. But to, to start to get at a more basic understanding of resilience, I'm going to go back to um, a quick example of some of the first hands-on teaching that I had the opportunity to do in Italy, um, teaching for the... Uh, University of Kansas. Um, they had a program that had been in existence for about 25 years that I inherited back in 2005. Um, and it's based uh, at this Tenuta, Tenuta di Spanocchia, which is very near Siena in central Italy. And it is um, an old agricultural estate of many thousands of, of acres that um, has dedicated itself for the last 50 years to um, 
relearning and um, uh, reinstituting uh, a more sustainable farming techniques, um, trying to help rehabilitate local um, plant uh, types and also local um, livestock. So um, it's a really interesting place where uh, a lot of uh, college students will go in the summertime to be agricultural interns. And uh, we would take a group of about a dozen architecture students every year to do some hands-on building. Um, as a large farm estate, there is the need for annual maintenance. Um, these are dry laid stone walls that, that form terraces um, that are very important for um, the agricultural production of a hilly place. And so the students would spend the first week learning the techniques from Italian masons of dry stone wall construction and learning about the soils and the water and, and whatnot. This is a three week program. Um, the next week, um, going from uh, uh, dry laid masonry um, to mortared masonry, the uh, masons there would find a tumble down building that we could, within the space of a week, rehabilitate for some use. So this was a pigsty um, that had kind of crumbled over the years. And the students learn a lot directly from the Italian masons, even if they don't speak much English. There's a kind of international language of construction and whatnot that you know is, uh, is a lot of fun. Um, so um, some of it's brick, some of it is uh, stone masonry. Um, and then some uh, kind of rustic traditional roof techniques using timbers and ceramic tiles that the students would learn about in week two. Um, and this project actually stretched a little bit longer, um, so we thought we would be done before the end of the week, but in fact there was the other end of the building, um, which uh, posed some unique problems um, at a smaller scale. So um, they got to uh, you know, get up close and personal with these uh, traditional materials. The third week um, then is often devoted to a slightly larger project, and this one year that I'm showing you of the three years that I spent doing this program um, has to do with a more um, technologically sophisticated re-roofing of a residential building where the roof beams had sagged, the, a lot of the roof tiles had broken, it was uninsulated, and so this is a process of using lightweight concrete to level the roof, um, not so that you're not replacing the um, perfectly good beams underneath that have simply sagged over the years, you're just making the roof flat on top. Um, uh, removing carefully all of the existing roof tiles and saving them for, for being put back in, um, two layers of insulation and some modern waterproofing um, on top of that, and then the original tiles put back on very carefully by hand. And so this was a process that we were able to do um, most of the roof of this building. You know, this, the, the local masons had to complete it um, after the end of our time there, but the students really got a good sense of um, what I think now, and I didn't think this then, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, is that this is a, a, a model of resilience, um, which I'm starting to think is a, a time-based response that is slower um, and more repetitive. So it's not like a one technology that's gonna solve every problem. It's like kind of agriculture that you have to go back and tend things every year or every season. Um, and it's less about technology and more social. At least these are qualities of resilience that I've come to identify and really appreciate. So I'm gonna um, uh, go pretty much within about the same year of the previous project um, when I got to the University of Kansas uh, in, in Kansas um, at about the same time that uh, Hurricane Katrina um, hit New Orleans. And um, this is where I met Patrick, um, who was among many um, college-based uh, design builders wanting to go down there and do some work. And this is an undergraduate studio that I undertook um, uh, with a teaching colleague named Nils Gore. And we decided that you know, we were certainly close enough to, uh, to New Orleans, it was only a thousand miles, we could drive it in 16 hours, one day, um, that you know, we, could, we could do this pretty easily, right? No problem. Um, on our first visit to the site, um, this is the building, this is the back of a building, it's a church, a community church, um, where we held our community meetings. And the thing that we were, uh, was impressed upon us by the local residents is that this isn't storm damage, that this is pretty much what this neighborhood church looked like before the storm. So some bits of it were, got a little bit worse, but um, this is the inside of, of this community church, and this is one of our community meetings. This is Nils Gore, uh, my good friend and colleague, and uh, we each had a studio worth of students, and so we combined them and brought them down there. Um, and we didn't come empty-handed. Nils and I had visited the community um, before we went with students, just the two of us, and. 
um, the community group that was forming, um, we asked them if there's something that we could provide pretty quickly. And they said, yeah, they, they didn't have telephone service yet and they, they wanted to create some neighborhood um, uh, interaction um, and, and be able to put notices up and whatnot. So they, this idea of kind of just community bulletin boards, notice boards was raised and we ended up making, uh, I think about four of these um, over the next few weeks and then bringing them to New Orleans when we brought the students to meet them. And um, they were completely prefabbed. They came, you know, mostly assembled. We just had to knock together a few pieces and place them around the neighborhood. Um, but the nice thing is that the community group also worked with some local, um, or a, a local oral history project to um, get some posters where uh, neighborhood, um, I would say members, but really some people who kind of were little pillars of the neighborhood, you know, who'd been there for a while, um, could be profiled, um, you know, so um, Nat Williams, you know, who's a, here's all the things that he does, you know, in true kind of New Orleans style, right? Um, so um, this was a lot of fun to be able to see those collaborative things that, that were coming out of this. We just made the infrastructure and, and other, other folks uh, filled in the pieces. Um, but what we came away with this first um, semester that we went down there in 2006, uh, spring of 2006, was that they didn't have a place for this community group to meet. Uh, they didn't have a building or anything, but they thought it would be wonderful to um, create a community garden that could be the kind of at least interim hub of their community uh, activities. And um, Nils and I thought this was a great idea. They, they had a site on North Robertson Street. Um, and so what we decided was we could give them maybe two things that would help them kickstart this as a community garden, a shade structure and a tool shed. And at that point we had a little over eight weeks left in the uh, semester, so we thought with his group doing one bit and my group doing the other, um, we could do something that could be designed and built and um, discussed with the clients at a distance and then brought there and assembled on site um, over the course of a three-day weekend. So that was our scenario. Um, I like to uh, design on the chalkboard. Patrick, I know, you're, you know your, your chalkboards are more famous than mine. Um, but uh, I use mine for engineering because I like to teach, you know, like if we're, we're going to you know, come up with like how many bolts do we need or you know, how thick is the plywood going to be. I want the students to understand the engineering that I can kind of do in my head and that they ought to be able to just have a feel for because um, we had to do it quickly. And, uh, so we did. Um, I have a background in engineering, um, and so I sort of, uh, it's nice to be able to do that and feel confident, because the thing I said to the students and to the clients is, we're not going to make some student project that's going to blow over in the next hurricane. That's like, you know, one promise, right? Um, so uh, without over, completely over-engineering it. So my students and I did the Shade Pavilion, and we made it a prototype for what could be an expandable system. Um, and we made one of them to bring down there. We eventually were asked to make a second one um, for an exhibition, and we did. But the concept behind it, given that we had a brand new CNC uh, router, and we could only make things out of four by eight sheets of plywood, um, but we wanted to make this 16 foot long by 12 foot high thing, um, is that, and we had to be able to transport it and assemble it on site, is that we would use lamination and a kind of sliding scarf joint system to be able to take these individual puzzle pieces and slide them together and bolt them um, and then put the thing together on site. You know, starting from all of that, which came in a truck, to building it in a kneeling position and then standing it up and, um, you know, installing the rain chain. Um, so here it is, um, shortly after its installation in New Orleans. Here it is on the day of its installation, and at that time, you know, most people were still, if their houses were damaged, you know, they either had blue tarps on top or they were living in FEMA trailers. And that's disaster uh, recovery, and that has to happen fast. You know, there's no doubt about it. But what we're doing, and, and although we did this quickly, it's, it's more about, as I'm thinking of it now, resilience, and it has to be able to have an impact that can be very slow. And um, so this is where I'm thinking about how, you know, if we're going to um, res be responding to increased numbers of disasters, there are these two phases. And um, maybe this one, we were acting fast, but we weren't really part of a recovery effort. I see it more as a part of a community building resilience effort. The, um, the tool shed, which Knowles' students uh, worked on, 
um, it was uh, very important because um, the reality in New Orleans is if you're going to have a community garden, the, one of the biggest worries is that all your tools are going to get stolen. So this had to be a robust uh, structure that could be locked. Um, his students worked hard to come up with some uh, really interesting uh, patterning that was inspired by African textiles um, and the shape of the uh, Mississippi River as it comes through uh, New Orleans. So this is four months after those two projects were installed, and this is a community meeting at the, uh, at the um, community garden, and you can see how quickly things grow. I mean, this is literally four months. We finished in May, and this is September. Um, and this is a, this, these aren't students, this is a community uh, group meeting out there. So that, that felt pretty successful. We made a second one of these uh, the next year. We were asked to include it in an exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York. And um, we did that on the caveat that they would pay for all the materials and they would also pay to have it shipped to New Orleans and installed um, here uh, in an, another community garden that's um, behind uh, the building that became the permanent home for this uh, cultural association called The Porch. Um, in the foreground is a, is a wonderful outdoor classroom space that Knowles Gore and his students made. Um, and we, we kind of, um, Knowles and I came to the conclusion that it wasn't worth doing a project like this unless we weren't committed to going back for at least three years. And so it wasn't going to be just like, go, go and do one thing and, and then you know, walk away and take the credit. But we had to say, you know, maintain a relationship with this community. And so we did. Um, the third year, this is what my students um, contributed now, to help them fit out this um, community center building that they had. They didn't have very much furniture. So we came up with a furniture system that could be as flexible as possible. It could be, they also wanted it to be able to be stored away when they didn't need to have it out. So these are uh, kind of these weird benches that could also be used as tables when they're in the horizontal position. Lightweight enough to move around, durable enough to be used as a stage. Um, and so that was, uh, that was a fun one. The students spend a long time on this one trying to wrap their minds around what the needs were and then come up with a system that could be, um, that could do all those things. Um, so that was, a, that was a fun one. And for me, this is, uh, this, is, this is the important thing. The Porch, Seventh Ward Cultural Organization, didn't exist before we started talking to some neighborhood folks. It doesn't um, exist because we were involved, but um, our work kind of grew along with them. Um, the, the sad story is that um, it has since disbanded. It was in existence for about 10 years. And uh, then, you know, for whatever reason, um, the, uh, the community garden is still there. Um, our shade pavilion is still there. This is one of the students who uh, worked on it in 2006. And this is about the 10th anniversary of it. Um, it needs a coat of uh, varnish. But other than that, you know, somebody else put the, uh, you know, the, the nice little tag on it there. So I couldn't be happier, you know, to see this thing um, being, you know, it, having been adopted by the community and still serving its role 10 years later. Um, it doesn't change, um, you know, the, the, the exacerbation of disasters. This is from last year, not even last year, this is like six months old, you know, where they just had a big spring storm and the pump system couldn't get the water out of New Orleans. Um, but I do think that um, this kind of work, by, by trying to leverage resilience, um, I think it can, I, I truly believe that um, the Seventh Ward is a more resilient community than it was before Katrina. Um, even if the porch, you know, played its role, we played our role and, uh, you know, we've moved on to other things. Where I've moved on uh, is to the University of Washington in Seattle. And in the West, um, we have, you know, the flip side of flood, which is fire. You probably see it in the news right now. You know, Southern California is burning. Uh, last summer, um, you know, Northern California and Washington State and Oregon were burning. Um, and not long after I arrived at the University of Washington, I got involved with a small town called Twisp, Washington, which is in the Cascade Mountains, about a four-hour drive east of Seattle. Um, and uh, they weren't responding to a fire at that point, but this is a, an area that is defined by wildfire. And um, our clients were a, a local group dedicated to economic vitality, education, the arts, um, sustainability, that was coming together in this town that is um, actually pretty poor. There are some wealthy people who have uh, vacation homes around the area, but most of the economy there is actually um, pretty slow uh, based on logging. And this uh, is a, oh boy, about a 
10 acre um, site that was the United States Forest Service um, facility right in the heart of town and the Forest Service put it up for auction and this community group got one of the rich people in their um, fancy house to contribute a million dollars anonymously to be the in the end the sole bidder to get this piece of real estate the fear in the town was that if they didn't try to get it and convert it to something uh, more um, useful for the town that like Walmart would buy it and put in a big box store and that would that would be it you know that's all they'd get um, so this group formed called Twistworks and uh, we got involved with them we went up for a lot of community meetings and charrettes and they had a whole bunch of empty buildings a lot of them sheds and nothing happening yet so the first year we went we proposed micro greenhouses that we could make and and we tore off the siding on one of these hundred foot long sheds that just you know kind of made a wall around the site to make the site more transparent and then we made these pretty simple um, units that have shelves inside to start seedlings and they're interested in agriculture um, there and we put some pvs little tiny ones to light these up at night um, and just gave some suggestions about how they could be used in different ways um, and that was fun. Um, they did end up using them in some different ways, and, and mostly, mostly they're, they're still there as a kind of signboard, um, almost like an art installation that they use to grow some seeds uh, once, once a year. But the next year, they said they were more interested in something that would be like a, a garden shed, a flexible system that they could deploy in different ways. And we took that as an opportunity to, to see if we could come up with something that had the robustness of a Quonset hut, but that had a little more um, formal uh, variability to it by being made out of a, a section of a torus um, that could be reassembled to kind of you know take on different shapes. The scenario here was that um, you know someone with the uh, ability to CNC route could prefabricate all of these individual panels that get bolted together to form sort of one wedge and then the wedges get bolted together and skinned you know to make this uh, kind of continual system. Uh, and, and variable systems. So we made one prototype of this, and um, they, they use it as an information kiosk now. They didn't, they didn't really have the wherewithal to, you know, kind of be able to support making a huge number of them, but they liked the concept. In the third year, um, I, I kind of decided that I didn't want to make something. I, I got in touch with a buddy of mine who teaches interaction design and had a bunch of fourth-year students. And what we, what we talked with the community group about and, and then with the students was um, because they still had a whole bunch of these empty buildings on this site, trying to animate the site through some site-specific installations that might help the community um, reflect on its own history and, and kind of think about you know, where they came from as they're trying to envision where they're going. And this was a lot of fun. We called it Ghost Works. Um, and, um, the students worked in interdisciplinary groups, uh, architects and, and information designers. Um, this is the town, it's not big at all. And this is you know, what its um, natural condition is. It, it, there, there was a series of fires in the mid 20th century that, that destroyed a lot of the town itself. Um, they've had some pretty serious fires, including last summer, that have come within hundreds of yards of the town. And in one fire a few years ago, they lost um, three firefighters, uh, volunteer you know, firefighters who just got overtaken by flames um, up in the mountains. Um, so that's one aspect of their collective history. This is a, a forest service um, facility that's now being repurposed. So forestry and the um, legends of fire um, was a, a topic taken up by a couple of the groups. Um, not all of them. I'll show you a, a variety of these. but. Um, this group went into the attic of a building there and created a, a very interesting installation that as you move through one way, you got visual clues and the light played interesting um, uh, kind of um, games with, with you visually. But when you turned around to go out the other way, there was a history of um, all the fires that are on record um, and their dates and some of you know, what happened during those fires. All these fires get names in the US. So this is you know, the Boulder Creek Fire and the Horseshoe Fire. Um, if you listen to the news right now about Southern California, you know, every one of those separate fires has a name. Um, so that's part of the history. But there's also a, a history of um, settlement, of settlers coming in the 19th century um, uh, from the East, European settlers. Um, interacting with uh, the local Native American community. 
Um, the name of the town, Twisp, uh, comes from the local native word for wasp. And so the idea of a hive um, it, it was interesting to the students. In this case, they decided to make it out of the lids of canning jars that settlers would use to can you know, fruit and preserves and things to keep them from uh, the harvest in the summertime and have them available um, through the winter. And so what they did was they created a whole kind of ceiling uh, surface of these um, with just a little translucent uh, surface that then they um, back projected images and some video storytelling um, by, the, by the, you know, the local community onto them. Um, this group, uh, smaller group, uh, uh, made up mostly of women, decided to do a kinetic installation um, uh, called tumbleweeds. And these are things that are um, based on the idea of wagon wheels and the, the wheels that, would, that the settlers would have had to you know, traverse um, the country to get out there, but also literally tumbleweed, because this is a part of the world that is like the opposite of Seattle, which is a kind of rainforest. Um, this is dry desert high country where there literally is, there's tumbleweed just blowing down the road. Um, so they made these things of various sizes that could be, um, they, they also imprinted some information on them, but the idea was that they could just be rolled around the site and kind of left there for people to discover and then you know, move somewhere else and you know, do this, um, this thing with. The most poignant of these um, was uh, this installation called Lingering Smoke, and it's inside a building that actually itself had burned and, and been rebuilt. And you could see very clearly where they had to put new um, wood members in the inside of this building. But what they did was they got, um, the students got a hold of um, transcripts of radio communications between firefighters and their base during one of these fires. And they picked out a number of them and then they, um, they, they laser cut them into these long strips of paper and hung them from the ceiling and also had actual um, recordings of some of this radio traffic um, going on. This is this end of this building had burned and was replaced. The other end did not burn. And um, so they were able to make this um, kind of eerie um, installation with where people could read and hear some of these words, you know, as people were reacting to um, what the experience of a, you know, the, of a fire and smoke was from the point of view of um, either firefighters who were right in the middle of it or people telling their story afterwards um, of what it was like to be fighting those fires. So this was fun and this um, organization has grown rapidly um, and we now keep in touch with them. Um, but this was during the first three years of their existence when um, of the 17 buildings on the site, they were really only using one or two of them. And so we were trying to inhabit the other ones to kind of give them a sense of what was going on. And it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, fire plays a role in the um, third uh, project. I'm going to show you this and one more um, in uh, Forks, Washington. Oops, this went kind of too quick. How did I skip things? Oh, no, wait. This is, I'm sorry. There's one other aspect of Twist that I'll talk about, um, which is uh, based on some of the early uh, discussions of their site, they came up with a master plan and then nothing was done with that for a while. So professionally as an architect, I took it on myself just to do a kind of thought exercise and a design exercise about um, one possible way to take the master plan that they had come up with during their community charrette and start to build it out um, with some different technologies um, and maybe some different kind of architecture than they would be looking for. You know, I think they were looking for things that looked woodsy and kind of like a, a, a store chain in the US called Cabela's, which is th these things that look supposed to look like a lodge and you go in there to buy all your hunting gear, you know, rifles and camouflage and all that. But um, the, for me, I was always, almost trying to prove that the, the architecture isn't the point, that this is a building built out of the land, built of the land, and built with an infrastructure to be a kind of an energy hub for all of the 17 buildings on site. Um, so it would be a centralized system based on the collection of water. It, it's, it, this is a part of the world where in the winter it snows heavily and you have to collect a lot of that water and, and save it for the summer, which is actually incredibly dry. And there are ways that you can do that while you're heating a building to create ice and to store the ice and also make a, it's kind of like a battery for energy so that you can, you're saving energy that you've, you would have been wasting in the winter because you don't use all of the heat you create to heat the building. 
and taking some of that energy and storing it as ice that in the summer when you do the phase change to melt it you can recapture that energy and use it for cooling um, besides having a, a source of water on site for doing things like fighting fire um, so it's fun it's, and this is just me you know looking at a, a possibility and, and putting my uh, capital A architect hat on um, so more fire, this time in Forks, Washington. Has anybody here heard of the um, vampire series called Twilight? Yeah? Twilight, yes, okay. Twilight is set in Forks, Washington. And it was, um, this is another logging town four hours away from Seattle, but in the opposite direction. So this is on the coast, on the other side of the Olympic Mountains in a part of Washington that gets about 160 inches of rain, so that's four meters of rainfall per year. Um, and uh, it is one of the wet wettest places in uh, North America. And um, in 2012, uh, they had a, a very small fire by, you know, compared to these other wildfires, but it, it took out, among other things, um, the oldest and maybe um, proudest building in town, which uh, was built as an Odd Fellows Hall, and I won't go into explaining what the Odd Fellows were, um, that had been turned into, in, over the years into their local art center um, with a pharmacy next door. And it took out both of those buildings. And um, their local city um, planner uh, knew about our work in um, Twisp, and he came to see if we would come and help them out because there was a little political thing going on where the city council um, were they were ready to get out of the business of running an art center anyway. You know, they didn't think it was so important to have an art center, and they had insurance on the building. and And if they decided to walk away from building a new building and just making a parking lot, they would get two million dollars. But if they decided to actually make and run an art center, they'd get four million dollars. And for a while, it was kind of iffy that you know, the city council, they seemed like they were going to say, let's have a parking lot, where they used to have, like, this is, was, in the end, it was like, like, like the only nice building in town. This town has one stoplight, and it's the only stoplight between, well, for about 150 miles along Highway 101. Um, so we went out there, got involved, we um, came up with some ideas that were based on earlier community meetings and presented them to folks and got them interested. They invited us back out to present them at the local softball and baseball tournament and set them up and just let people come and see what it was about. And it created uh, enough brouhaha that um, when they did, when they finally voted, it like, you know, the vote went by one, by one vote to build an art center rather than a parking lot. Um, so that was good. Um, and here's just some examples of ideas that the students came up with. This is a little more in that timber vernacular that, you know, the Northwest people kind of like a lot. Um, but the, the people liked it. The um, town hired a professional firm called NAC Architects, and fortunately they're friends of, of ours because when, when NAC started, you know, they looked at the work that my students had done. There was no pressure that they were supposed to take that and actually build one of the student projects. But when they were presenting this to the town, the people in the town were saying, but wait a minute, the students did better, their projects were better than yours. <laughs> and so it was good that I was there to like apologize and say, you know, Guys, like, don't you know? You're you're on a good track. Like, go ahead and do this. But we had also um, kept our relationship with the town going and done a few projects in between, some Habitat for Humanity houses and stuff like that. And um, we asked them if we could do the last kind of um, the finishing bit of the art center when it finally got built, um, which was to put acoustic panels in their main meeting space and to design them, fabricate them, and install them. Um, so at the uh, at the opening, at the grand opening, there, you know, they, they had these different desires. They wanted to be able to sometimes display art, but they definitely needed an acoustic treatment to this room because, the, believe me, the acoustics were terrible. And there was a, an acoustic engineer involved that we could work with. Um, and so we did, um, came up with some designs, prototyped two different approaches, brought them out to the site, got community feedback figured out how to actually measure things and get them to line up and not misalign. That's a, an, an air uh, supply vent that needs to line up with something to let the air through. And um, arrived at a system that's highly engineered for the different um, aspects of sound that you need in a room that's going to be used for a variety of purposes. So we um, panelized the system. The lower panels 
um, are reversible, and I'll show you how they work, um, with some pinup space on one side of the panels and um, acoustic um, diffusion on the other. Everything is backed up with a whole lot of acoustic insulation to absorb certain frequencies, and the upper panels are all fractured to um, disperse um, high, high energy um, sound. So this is what it looks like um, with some ceiling um, deflectors as well. Um, our panel system. It was technically um, very challenging, both from the acoustic point of view, but also having to integrate all of the stuff that goes into a room. And you never notice that unless you have to, you know, you would like look at this room and you'd suddenly start saying, oh, we've got all of these things attached to the walls and everything. We've got to, like, they have to um, work somehow, fire, um, fire alarms and, and whatnot. Um, but, um, they, we felt pretty good about it, and uh, you know they they liked it too. Here you can see, you know these panels have all been flipped around um, so that you could display artwork or something on them very easily. Here's a, a panel partially open, and the design is such that you get different acoustic performance if this um, the pin pinup surface is facing out versus this reflective surface, or if you have panels that are set at an angle, so they can kind of tune the room. And they've done that for different uh, different kind of events, right? Small group of students um, uh, from all over the world, as it turns out. Um, and this is this is here are the panels in use. This is their um, planning director, uh, Rod Fleck, and this is a group that came another year after that to design some bus shelters for them out of um, uh, cross laminated timber. We actually made our own cross laminated timber and made four tables for them to have something better than the usual plastic folding tables for their community center. Um, it was a really good about four year relationship. And we got to learn things if we go back to the um, twilight um, part, you know, the, uh, the Native Americans who were the sort of werewolves, they um, were, um, you know, their, their part in the movie was um, uh, based on the Quileute um, Native American tribe. Here are, are uh, members of the Quileute uh, at the opening dedication of the art center and here's where they live. Um, it's an amazing place. It's a fishing village where the Twisp River meets the Pacific Ocean. Um, it is it, an astounding landscape. Um, and these, this driftwood, you know, they are, these, this, this is the base of a huge tree that's fallen in the ocean and washed its way up here. Um, the surf here is amazing. And um, this is just a kind of normally wavy day. And students literally had to run and jump up on logs to avoid getting, like this is water, getting soaked by these waves. The, the difficulty for this um, community that's lived here for uh, many hundred years is that occasionally we get huge earthquakes that produce tsunami waves. And that c could potentially wipe out their, their whole village settlement, which is here. And the, you know, the best travel time by foot is 10 minutes. Um, to, to safety, and there isn't that kind of warning for a tsunami. You know, you might feel a, you know, it's like in Japan when they had tsunamis there. You might feel the earthquake and you don't know that, you know, there is a, a wave racing toward you at um, hundreds of miles an hour. So they made a decision, the tribe did, um, to relocate um, to this area. They had to negotiate with the federal government to get a piece of Olympic National Park, uh, and they did. And um, so they're going to, in a phased way, first they're going to move the school, and then they're going to move the um, places where the uh, the older residents um, spend much of their day. You know, the kind of the more vulnerable populations sort of get moved out of harm's way, you know, first, and they're going to try to, in the end, get most people to move their houses as well and to live on higher ground. Um, for me, that is uh, it's a great example of resilience. It requires an incredible amount of planning. Um, and it will take a lot of time, but it's it, better that than having to do recovery from a disaster, right? Um, and it's my feeling that, you know, that working with a community to have a, a, a community gathering place like this helps promote resilience. I wouldn't say this is itself tremendously resilient as architecture. It is, you know, it's, it's an, an agent for um, resilience. Um, and this community center is used for everything. Um, so. We're just happy to see um, it being adopted by the community. Um, and all of this work that I've been showing is less about technology and, and it's more about social uh, agency and whatnot. Oh yeah, I'm not, not doing too bad. I'm gonna show one last project, um, mostly because it's a lot of, it was a lot of fun. And, um, and this is maybe a little bit more about technology, but also about resilience. Um, in 2013, um, 
I had an opportunity working with, I have friends at Arup, I worked at Arup in London in, in the advanced geometry unit for a couple of years. And um, I keep in touch with Arup, especially the Seattle office. Um, and Olson Kundig architects who um, are pretty well known in the magazines, you, know, you might have heard of them. Um, to do something that was based on um, a treehouse, um, but the idea is to engage kids in um, being excited about engineering, architecture, the arts, um, and whatnot. So it was a fun um, eight-week summer program where we um, recruited a bunch of kids and got them in a room and ha had them dream about what a robot treehouse might be and gave them you know, ways to draw, gave them prompts, gave them, uh, we, we, the students made these little sort of model trees, and gave the students pipe cleaners and cardboard and all kinds of stuff, and um, got their ideas. As we evaluated their ideas, it seemed like there were just a couple of approaches that stood out. One was to make a box around a tree. Another one was to kind of, um, in a snake-like way, kind of weave your way up and through the tree, uh, or a cantilever from, you know, like sort of as if you're climbing a tree, or and maybe it's because we gave them pipe cleaners, a lot of them started to um, suspend platforms and elements on tension members. And we got pretty excited about that and started playing around with um, prototypes and models for what we eventually settled on, which is a um, kind of multi-platform system all hanging in tension um, around the tree. And something that is flexible enough that you could, you know, install it on different trees and you could use the three platforms in different combinations. So we wanted to um, e explore this and prototype it, but also explore that kind of flexibility um, to, for it to adapt to different trees or different scenarios. We did things that you're familiar with from Design Build here, you know, taping things out on the floor to see, like, how big is it really? Um, but we poured a bunch of time into Grasshopper and, um, uh, because we wanted to be able to take this um, relatively simple system and, and kind of prove that adjustability. So it's a pretty straightforward um, definition in the end because you know, all, we just sort of import the geometry for the, the, each platform and for the, um, the braces. What we're really trying to figure out are the cable lengths to give it different geometries. But also, we've um, encoded it so that you, we could take a an approximation or a scan of the center line of a tree. So if the tree is kind of warped or you know has a funny shape to it, we could actually put that in there and um, adjust both the position um, and distribution of the of the platforms, but have it adjust to a different tree, right? And what the only thing that changes here are these numbers, which are the lengths of each cable um, that we would need to then suspend these platforms in different orientations, kind of subtly around a tree. Um, I wish that we'd used aluminum, but we used steel. Um, for a lot of reasons, I wish we'd, because right now, you know, these are like super rusty. Um, but um, we do a lot of stuff with wood, so the basic te tectonic of it is this, um, you know, um, steel framework that can be bolted together around the tree, and then um, these almost furniture-like pieces get, um, you know, attached to it. So here we are testing it. You know, we, we have this strap that grabs onto the tree, and then we assemble one of these hexagon frames on the ground, um, get some ropes to get it up approximately in place, and then put the steel cables in and tension those. We'll get them to the right length, and then we find, do some fine tuning with a tension adjustment, and then put the, put the wood um, pieces on. So, um, you know, first one, then the second one. You know, you have to assemble these on the ground, pick them up. You know, this is where aluminum would have been nice because um, they're pretty heavy. Um, and then get your cables in place. But, you know, this is all of that, <laughs> which looks pretty messy, is just to get, you know, this, which we eventually, you know, put into spreadsheets and just measured by hand and, you know, said, okay, this one needs to be, you know, 46 inches long, what have you. Um, and you climb through it um, just from opening to opening. Um, in this case, we, we put the levels pretty close together with each other. They could be farther apart, so kids of different ages could stand up. But when we brought the kids back, um, who provided some of the inspiration at the beginning, and they'd come to see what we were doing along the way, they had a good time. Older people did too. Um, so kids of every age um, had fun here. And so there it is. 
that's my nephew climbing up through it. He was um, he was part of that group. He was pretty he was pretty stoked. Um, so I also see education as an investment in future resilience. Um, I suppose I could kind of call almost anything an investment in resilience if it's done well, if it's meant to promote something bigger than just itself. Um, so maybe my my working definition of resilience is a little too broad, um, but that's where I am right now. Anyway, and it's been a pleasure to share this work with you. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And uh, thank you again for inviting me to AUS. Any questions? Yes, in the back. There are two right next to each other. Wow, OK. You guys fight it out to see who goes first. Good. Okay, my, my sister, my stepsister, um, lives in the Virgin Islands. I'm, I'm going there later this spring. Yes. No, no. Absolutely, and I, I apologize if it, uh, I was unclear um, about my attitude about technology. I, I think the kind of technology you're talking about is really um, ne necessary infrastructure, both at a large scale and even then if that has is challenged at a closer to home scale the, for, for the, the needs of survival, right? Uh, water, sewer, you know, lighting. 
right? And I, I know those things, I think, are very much uh, issues where technology can and, and must enhance uh, resilience. I think I, I was really here, I'm talking from personal experience and really being, as somebody who uh, I was studied engineering, I've worked as an engineer, I've worked as an architect, I'm reflecting more on the social almost maybe because of you know the fact that it, to solve you know some of the problems in a place like New Orleans which I'm more familiar with or Puerto Rico now requires you know huge infrastructural spending you know we have to be involved also in politics and to be fighting for the kinds of investments that governments need to make and the kind of thinking that innovative technology can help to solve these problems maybe for less money or to have more resilient infrastructure. So I apologize if it seemed like I was saying, no, that that's not important. I'm talking about from my sort of perspective as a design build guy at a university, you know, um, because, yeah, it, frankly, it's, it's hard to uh, imagine. I, that's why I'm going to go down to the Caribbean and, you know, get a, a sense of, like, well, what can, you know, what, what could I, if I even thought it was worthwhile to bring students down there for three years in a row, what, you know, what could we really do, right? And how, what could be best? And maybe it's to invent things that help people, as you were saying, um, be able to have a, a more decent quality of life while they rebuild. Yeah, so thank you, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I I I can't hear you. In forks, yes. Well, um, because the uh, you know legally we couldn't be the architects, right? Um, I mean, I'm a licensed architect. They they could have hired me, but they for liability, you know, all kinds of things. Um, the city hired a professional architecture firm with you know lots of employees to you know to be the architect, um, and I think that they were happy to um, have things rethought. As it turned out, we had designed all of them as two-story buildings because the original art center was a two-story building, and and we thought that that and for the scale of the town that that would be good. And what they found out was even though they had four million dollars to work with, um, they had bought the site next door and they it, they figured out that it'd be better to make a one-story building a more efficient use of the money. Um, you don't have to have an elevator, or, you know, lift, right, those things. So they, they needed to change things and, you know, and go with that. And there were some aspects of the architect's design I kind of, like, I looked a little sideways at. But in the end, it's a very effective building. Um, so I don't feel badly that the arch I felt badly when some of the town people were coming up to me and the town, you know, the city planner and even the architects and saying, the students' projects were better. You know, I, I took that as a compliment, but I, you know, I didn't want to offend, you know, my colleagues either, right? So, anyway, yeah. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your, you know, studio afternoon and this last week of reviews and whatnot. I'm so happy to see uh, many of you here who I saw for your review yesterday and maybe some who I'll see on a review tomorrow um, and others who uh, are just here because, um, Something seemed interesting on the poster or something like that. I'm happy to uh, answer other questions or, or talk with any of you after here, but um, you know, I said I would keep this uh, you know, under an hour and I wanna be true to that. So thank you again for coming out.